Um, hello guys, thank you so much for coming to another talk. Um, obviously we have a very exciting talk about um, the, the IP copyright laws in Malta and there is absolutely no other person uh, as qualified as this beautiful lady over here, Janine Rizzo. I wish I could actually roll my arms, but I am incapable of rolling my arms, so I do apologise. Um, no need to. Without further ado, um, yeah, um, any questions, we will uh, leave them. Would you prefer to, the to end. Yeah, let's leave the questions to the end. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> no. You've got a reputation um, already. We haven't even started yeah, yet. Absolutely, no, no, no. It's going to be a really interesting talk, so without further ado... Thank you. Jenny. Thank you, Frank. Thank you to all for the warm invitation to come and speak to you again. I've already addressed... What was it called, Frank, the one where I spoke to? It was the annual conference, was that it, the convention? So if you were there, this might have a little bit of overlap, okay? Um, uh, but I've tried to put in other information to keep things fresh and to get you more, well, up to date with things, okay? So my name is Janine. I am a lawyer. <laughs> Lawyers. Uh, but... I'm a lawyer who specializes in artistic work and heritage and that sort of thing. So, a bit nicer to stomach than other lawyers, you could say. Yeah? <laughs> uh, like all lawyers, I have to start with a disclaimer. This is not legal advice, okay? Sometimes particularities of your specific cases might change the whole context of what we're talking about. So, do learn the basic principles that I'm going to teach you today, but then remember that we need to be mindful that you need to get legal advice for your specific issues, go to a lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So what is intellectual property? A lot of people get stuck on this first point. Intellectual property is usually a creation of your minds, of your own creativity, okay? And a lot of people get confused. What name to use? Uh, do I patent a name? Do I trademark my photograph? There's a lot of different words and names that by the end of today, you're going to be a little bit more familiar with and a little bit more comfortable in saying, okay? And when someone rips you off, you know what to tell them. That's the best thing. So an important point to keep in mind is that they are products of your minds. So they are intellectual creations, but they are also property assets Shijifiri, what does it mean? What can you do with property? You can own it, you can sell it, you can rent it out. The same thing with your photographs, with your intellectual property, okay? It's important to keep that in mind because a lot of people think in black and white. It's mine and then it's no longer mine because I gave it to you. But there's a lot in between of the it's no longer mine because I gave it to you, all right? So that's why we say it is capable of being owned, sold, and licensed. We will cover what licensed means later, okay? And an important point is that this is for works which have been created and not for ideas. Ideas cannot be protected, okay? Um, that is not just in Malta, but everywhere around the world that ideas <coughs> cannot be protected. It is the expression of the idea that is protected Okay, think about Romeo and Juliet and the, the plot line. A guy and a girl, they meet and they fall in love, but their families hate each other. It's the subject of many books, poems, songs, paintings, <laughs> musicals, okay? So the idea at the basis is not protected, but then the way we express it will be protected. So what are the intellectual property rights? They are patents to protect inventions, usually products or processes, What's an invention in the photography field? Hmm, a new lens, perhaps, right? A new system of uh, capturing photographs underwater, for example, okay? That could be protected by a patent. Design rights protect the way something looks, such as the Eames chair, right? Or a certain, I, I tell my students, when you go to the atrium, Okay, and there's like the Alessi section or the Joseph Joseph section. Those are all things that are protected by a design right because they are things that you would otherwise have in your house, an armchair, a lamp, um, uh, I don't know, uh, 
a bottle opener, but they have a very different look, a very characteristic look. So design rights usually protect that. However, design rights are also used to protect the GUI of apps and video games. So whoever is involved in that area, design rights can also help you there. Um, design rights and patents need to be registered. Patents will last 20 years from the date of application, and design rights last for five years, but you can renew them up to a total of 25 years, every time in five year periods, okay? Then we have trademarks. In the photography world, what could, what could a trademark be? Canon is a trademark, the name of the makers of the, of the of photographs. It could also be you've given a name to your studio. Um, motion blur or whatever, okay? They are names that can be registered as trademarks. There is a lot of rules of what can and cannot be registered as a trademark. Let's get to know the most basic ones. The most basic ones is you can't have a, a descriptive name for your trademark. So if I'm in photography and I call it smiles photography, okay, maybe it's not descriptive, but it's a word that people would use, you know, smile, say cheese, you know? You know, you can't register that as a trademark because the trademark has to be distinctive to distinguish you from your competitor. Think about all these hairdresser salons. Unfortunately, I always use them as an example, but all of them are like hair style or hair tomorrow or char and char this and char that, char studio, hair studio. Those are all generic, generic, not descriptive, not sufficiently distinctive names and the trademark office will not register them if you apply to register those trademarks. So if you're ever thinking of creating a brand name for you, think about something a little bit out of the box, okay? Trademarks are also registered. You can register them either in Malta or for the whole of the European Union, and they last you 10 years and can be renewed in 10 year periods up to a total of forever, <laughs> which is great. Then we have copyright, which is what we're going to be focusing on mostly today. So I won't spend time talking about it. Then we have the database right. So your database of clients, for example, or customers, that's a database, right? And you have IP over that. So if someone you're working with steals it from you, that's an infringement of your intellectual property rights, for example, all right? And then we have another intellectual property right. It's a mouthful to say, all you need to know is that it protects um, the way uh, microchips are laid out, like a map, okay? So I want to talk to you more today about interesting things like how do you qualify your work and how do you enter into a relationship with other people you are working with, your client or your employer, okay? What work are you doing? So what is your work exactly? Why do I say this? Because three quarters of the time that I review contracts, the work, what you have to be doing isn't stated in the contract. And that's a bit like, defeats the purpose of the whole contract, or only a bit of what you're supposed to be doing is said in the contract and not everything that you're supposed to be doing, that as well defeats the purpose. Put everything that you need to be doing into your contract. I need to take your photos, but I also need to edit them and deliver them to you on what? Uh, hard copy, digitally, via we transfer, whatever. Put it in the contract, because if you don't say it, then it's not clear with the other side. We need to be clear. The more clear we are, the less we get caught in, I'm being filmed, <laughs> messes not of our doing, okay? I had clients and I have friends. I have a client who's a very, he's, not a, he's a friend and he's also a client who Frank knows also very well. He's a well-established photographer in Malta. He took a photo shoot for the um, cover of a magazine and he told me the amount of edits they made me carry out and take off a pimple here and make the arm look thinner there and change the color a bit here and then airbrush a bit more here. He told me it was not worth the amount I, I quoted for them. It, it was much more than the whole photo shoot itself, the editing and they come back and ask for more and I have to do it again. So do we need to put this into your contract? Hell yes, okay? We need to put that into your contract. So then, what are your rights? The rights over the work that you've created. Hmm? And what is your status? Are you self-employed? Are you working for an employer? 
Um, do you have clients and therefore then they get you on a contract of service, meaning you're self-employed and you, and you hire yourself out? And, and would you ever use a contract? I like to ask people this. Would you ever use a contract? Most people tell me no. Don't worry, I don't get offended. But most people tell me, would you ever use a contract? Do you use contracts? Yeah. I'd, like to. I'd like to. A lot of people, a lot of people go, nah, contracts, that's boring. And then something goes wrong, and then a contract needs to be like, would have same with you kind of thing. Um, so some more considerations that we have to keep in mind. What is your agreement with your client or with your employer? Let's think to my friend, okay, and how many rounds of edits do I need to carry out? That would be something you would want to put in. And what if the client moves the parameters or adds things to them? I always use the example of my husband. My husband now is a wine importer, but before he used to be in the construction industry. And when he was in the construction industry, he'd have a client, and she'd tell him like, listen, I just want you to change the bathroom for me, fine, and he'd give her a quote. And then once he's carrying out the work, and then it's like, oh, can you uh, paint the stairwell? And then look, you know, I have a few wonky tiles. Can you change them for me? And you know what, the front garden needs a new path. Can you do that for me? And all of a sudden from this has become half the house. And because people are, which really call no, you know, really horrible. They don't know where they get the whole guts to say this. Ah, but this is not what you quoted me when he gives her the bill. You quoted me this. I'm only going to pay you this, and you'll be there going, uh, 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 what, what do you? Uh, uh, because he didn't put a contract. Because it was such a small piece of work, I didn't put a contract in place, and he's married to me. I could have written the contract for him. But anyway, <laughs> so what happens if they add or move the parameters? If, we're, if we have a contract, in the contract we would have written, if you're going to add more work, it's going to be at another fee. Uh, at least they can't get away with it of paying me only the first fee. Who owns the intellectual property? We will understand why we have to ask this question during the course of our talk. And what intellectual property are we talking about? Because we're seeing... There's a long list of different things that are intellectual property. So if I'm being hired by, I don't know, Valletta Cultural Agency and I've developed a database of all you know, of the photographers in Malta, I've created a database for my employer as well, not just taken photos and written reports, for example. So there's always layers of intellectual property that we could be talking about. I like to tell my students, um, have you ever watched the film Shrek? And Shrek says, ogres are like onions. We have layers, and that's the, the truth with IP. There's layers, layers upon layers upon layers of different rights and different things that could apply to your work, okay? I've already covered this, right? I went up instead of down. Okay, there we go. Um, another thing to have to consider, what is your role? Photographer or also transporter? and light rigging guy, you know? I mean, do you have to do everything? Or just, I come in, I take the photos, and I leave, because everything's ready for me. It's important, no? To have that clear with the client. Um, who is responsible to acquire rights? So for example, what rights need to be secured? Model releases, perhaps? Uh, location releases, loc location permissions. We're going to have the photo shoot at the Barakata Fo, so we probably need to go to Valletta Local Council for that. Um, we're going to do it at Casa Rocca Piccola, so we need to speak to El Marquis de Piro for that. Okay, there's different owners that we will have to hit up for the different elements of our photo shoot. Um, what about personality or life rights? I'm, I'm doing a film about Mintov, okay? So perhaps I need to contact his heirs to get like the green light in order to do this. Um, and am I going to be using names or logos? For, this is especially good for films. Um, so for example, in films, if you have any logos appearing, they need to be cleared. So, you know, you always get, this program might have uh, eight style prodotti. At the moment, everyone's watching Love Island, and that's the first thing that comes up before Love Island starts. Done the program, you want to do it eight style prodotti, obviously, because you need to clear with the owner of the trademark. Nice example. Uh, you know Caterpillar, the makers of these big machines that like, are used in excavations and, and construction? There was a cartoon, kind of like Ferngully, but it was more recent, 
where there was this jungle or this rainforest which was going to be destroyed. And the machines destroying the jungle had Caterpillar written on them. Caterpillar got in touch with the, with the makers of the film and told them, you're putting us in a very bad light. Everyone's going to hate us now. But we don't do that. I mean, we build buildings, we build hospitals, you know, blah, blah, blah. So take off our names. So they had to edit the film after it was released to remove Caterpillar because they were going to get sued. So we have to be careful about these things. Um, it's not just, oh, yeah, yes, Mishorta. No, that was Malta until 10 years ago. We don't live anymore in, oh, yeah, yes, Mishorta anymore. Um, so there you go. Um, and what is being requested of you? That's something as well I would put into the contract. What are your deliverables? Raw files, edited files, editable files. Most people in this room <coughs> will hate being asked for the raw files. And I used to be one of them. I used to be one of the lawyers who would say, never, you're never going to touch my client's raw files. But now I'm on the other side. And I do some work where some international artists are involved. Big names, OK? Big names with big egos. Let's put the things out there. But they're really strict about how they curate any image of their artwork. And so they ask for the raw files. So it won't be me or like enough a, a government agency that needs the raw files, but it's because abroad they need them from us because the artist has an ego which is as huge as Mount Everest and needs to edit the raw file themselves. Because it's all about the coloring, the color gradient, and the mood of the photo that gets sent out of the artwork, for example. And it's the same for all that series of artworks that, that, that artists have done, has done. It makes sense when you think about it. So when I went to, for the first time you know, to the photographer with like, listen, you've taken these photos of this artwork that's being installed in Malta. I'm asking you for the raw files. I got <laughs> And I'm like, but listen, because the artist abroad like, has this huge ego, and they only want a very certain like, niche kind of look out there. You know, so whenever you Google image this, these, these works, you always find the same kind of tone and the same way. Oh, OK. I'm like, so, so it wasn't so bad, right? And like, ah, because you explained it, though. So conversation and communication is key. OK, so always communicate with your client, with your employer. What do I need to give you? What's the format that we have to pass on to the client? If you're working, for example, for a, an agency, OK, but they are promised to their own clients. And then so it's not just the work doesn't stop at the agency. It keeps on going. Um, so I have to be careful about that. Um, I was contacted by the owner of a shop because a photo shoot happened in the street, but with his shop front as the backdrop. Because it's a beautiful shop front, but it was the backdrop of the photo. And they're like, they didn't ask for permission to take photos of my shop front. And then you have to get into this whole writing to these big companies in Malta. Listen, ah, you made a photo shoot, and you didn't have permission to shoot in front of us. But then, technically, they were shooting in the street. Now, I'm not authentic with the word street photography. Street photography, not for now, has gone down the toilet. <laughs> Whereas, until 2018, I used to say, you can do anything in the street. Take any photo on the street. Thanks to the GDPR that got passed in 2018, you cannot take photos of people's faces in the street anymore, they even though they're in the street. But the GDPR says, as long as the person is identifiable, what if I have this amazing tattoo and only I have it in Malta? I'm identifiable by my tattoo. So you have to be careful. You're not taking a photo of my face, but you're taking a photo of my leg. Identifies a person. We're going to be seeing it now in, in, in the slides. But you have to be very careful about, and then, for example, um, sensitive information about sensitive data about a person includes religious data. What if you, in the photo of me in Republic Street, you catch me walking into a church? Or over here, you catch me walking into the mosque? That's sensitive data, and you need more than just consent from me. So we have to be really careful about street photography now. So when I, I used to be like, yes, street photography, do what you want. Now it's become, <laughs> hold your horses, be careful. In fact, many times, very, very prominent foreign street photographers have assistants running behind them, handing out model releases to people who might have been in the shot. Unfortunately, that's, the, that's where we've, got, we've gotten to. 
Now, we're going to see more about how we own our IP, but in a contract, it's not default that you are giving away the, your copyright, for example, okay? You could give permission. Permission is called a license. A lot of people get confused. What exactly is a license? <laughs> a license in intellectual property law means I'm giving you, I'm granting you the right to, to use, okay? And it can be very limited. I'm giving you permission. For how long? For what use? Can this uh, use be repeated? Is it paid, this use? And is it exclusive? Example, I give you a license for the non-exclusive, meaning other people can also do it, use of a photo to be used in the summer edition 2020 of Taste and Flair magazine for print and online distribution. It can be used on Facebook and Instagram adverts for the edition of that magazine. Look how specific I have been. That's the level of specific we need to be. It's not, yeah, sure, I'll take your photo for the magazine. What magazine? Which edition? How many times can you use the, the photo? In every edition for 2020 or for 2023, now for 2023. My fr a very good friend of mine is a model and uh, he signed a model release form to appear on a billboard for a company in Malta. The billboard was up for over 10 years. And he contacted me, he told me, a light now, a little you know, like, can I tell them to take the billboard down now? I told him, did they, did they give you a model release form? And he told me, yes, let me send it to you. Because it's quite strict, you know, model release forms, etc., etc. And the model release form was drafted in a way that said, you have permission to use my image for the advertising of your company. Ek, free, nothing, no restrictions. I told them, so they're doing what you allow them to do. 10 years down the line. Horrible. Someone I know wants to, because everyone knows I do this work. I'm one of few people who do this work here. And everyone comes up to me with their horror stories. And this uh, photographer came up to me. He told me, I was commissioned by a huge company in Malta. They should know what they're doing to take a photo of a very specific um, event in Malta. And one of the photos I took, they liked it so much that they put it on their credit cards. So every person in Malta had a credit card with that photo on it. Insane. Never paid for it, and they had never specified what the use of those photos. Like, you know, you go, you say, I'm gonna be an event photographer, right? I'm photographing an event. And one of the photos from that event ends up in everybody's wallet, basically, in Malta. Shmati daish. No? It makes you swear. Huh? Goosebumps, right? And you don't see a dime, and they never got permission. Technically, we could have sued them and won, because they never got permission. But they told me, why? I create enemies? I have to live from this job. So if we give them a contract in the first place and they pull that kind of stunt with us, at least we tell them, hey, the contract didn't allow you to do this. Because that's what I had done for a client of mine. A client of mine is a composer. Well, he's, a, he's passed away, so his clients are, my clients are his family. And uh, this um, government entity told us, can we use one of his songs because we are unveiling Piazza San George and the fountain is going to dance to his music. Great, sure, here you have a, a contract, a license, because we are allowing you to use the song for that specific occasion. The song doesn't become theirs, it is still ours, that's why it's a license, okay? And, and so, um, they had to use it for that occasion. We got paid, everything went well, blah, blah, blah. Two months down the line, I'm reading, because I had time back then, the letters to the editor on the Times of Malta, and one of the letters was, how beautiful it is to walk around Valletta and hear the music of a uh, 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 composer in Valletta every hour on the hour. I was like, Shinu, <laughs> what? Phoned up the family, did you know about this? No, and I phoned up the people <laughs> that we had given a license to. I'm like, listen, the license was for the opening on that day only. What do you mean you're playing it every hour on the hour every day? <gasps> oh, sorry, 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 sorry. We didn't know it wasn't covered. 
And then we figured out a way for the family to get paid, and they did it for about three or four years, where the song was used every hour on the hour in Valletta. Because we have to be specific. If we're not specific, people take advantage. People are experts at taking advantage. Okay? So the more we know our rights, the more we state how we want you to use our work, that's why, what are my deliverables, what do I need to do, what do you need my work for? Ah, I need you to take photos of my wedding, great. Someone told me I was a photographer at a wedding and then the bride put in the photos for a photography competition and won. <laughs> Sorry, it's hilarious. But it happens, man, it happens. You have to be careful. Insane, what else? What about payment? How do I put my payment? Is it the payment for me to offer you the service? You're paying me to get out of bed and come and take photos of your event because I'd rather be at home in bed with my cat kind of thing. Or are you paying me for the license of the copyright on my photo? You want to put my photo on every credit card in Malta. Show me the money. No? but you're also paying me for going to take the photo. So sometimes my contracts have payment for two things. The service that I'm creating for you, taking photos, doing a photo shoot, whatever, and the granting to you of the copyright in order to do whatever the hell it is you want to do with the photo. Put it in a magazine, put it on social media. Remember, it's not one and the same thing, putting it on the magazine and putting it on social media. Those are two different uses. So we need to have foresight. Hmm, you're going to put it in the magazine, okay, but I'm sure the magazine, you're going to put it online, you know, there are those, like, you can flip a magazine online, there are like these pages where you can flip, you're going to put it on one of those, yes, I am, and I need permission for that as well. And you're going to do, like, you're going to run a campaign, our new edition is out, and with a few, like, choice photos, is it going to be one of them? So you need permission for that as well. That is, if I remain the owner of the photo. If I transfer the ownership of the photo to you, then it's a different story, okay? Kind of, or I just deliver them to you, kind of thing. But I need kind of a down payment so that I do this, so I need a deposit. So we start planning our payment in this way. <clears throat> do you have a clause about late payment? How late is late payment? According to European Union law, I think it's about 30 days only. Shocking because most companies in Malta will pay you 90 days later. Oh, those are our terms, okay? Take it or leave it. Kulhatek, not just with artists, with everyone. I told you, my husband's in the wine industry also. 90 days. Okay, fine. Do you have a clause about late payment? You cannot, you cannot fire a big um, percentage on late payment. The cap under Maltese law is 8%. More than that, then it's usura, which is a criminal act. So you cannot charge more than 8% per annum, okay? Late payment fee. Is there, is there another mechanism? Because 8% per annum is, like, if a company wants to delay the payment, what the other law? <laughs> yeah, but then you can take them to court. We have the, pay, we have the clause <laughs> in your contract, and they signed it. Yeah, I know. That, is it worth it? I know. That's a big issue. That's the big issue. That's the big issue. That's the big issue. That's why maybe we ask for the deposit first, so at least we get something. And maybe, you know, they're more willing to pay the deposit first. Yeah? Apparently, you need to charge deposits. So, so you know, try and be crafty in that way with um, getting people to part with their money. We'll come to this point later. Um, and how is your payment structure? So again, this whole deposit thing, is it one lump sum? Are you paid by installments? Is there a royalty per unit sold? So what is a royalty? A royalty is a figure that gets generated for every item sold with your image on it. So if we're talking about photography here, okay? So somebody loves your photos, wants to put them on t-shirts and sell the t-shirts, or wants to make calendars and send the calendars, or put them on mugs and sell the mugs, or all of the above. Fine, great. Um, enough, you're going to be, what's a big event? The GCSC, the GSSC, the Small Nations Games, for example. You are, um, you've created something for the Small Nations Games, 
and your, whatever you've created for them is going to be on every um, uh, T-shirt that, them, that they're selling or on keychains or whatever, on merchandise, right? How do you get paid for that? Do you get paid one lump sum because you know they're not going to, they're not going to sell much kind of thing? <laughs> they don't know how to sell. They'll sell nothing. I'll just charge 5,000 5, euro and it's enough. Or do I also ask for a royalty? So I'm going to charge you 2,500 euro. And then for every item you sell with my image on it, I get fill in the blanks. 10%, 5%, 1 euro, 10 cents, 50 cents, whatever it is that you want to put in. Something that you can also negotiate. Right? There is no law on what you can or cannot do here. Other countries have certain laws. Other countries have, for example, guidelines published by bodies like the MIPP or MEA. I'm, a, I'm a, on the executive committee of MEA, the Malta Entertainment Industry and Arts Association, for example. We don't have that in Malta yet, you could say. So you can go wild. But again, it depends on the project. I'm going to photograph a wedding. I'm not going to ask for a royalty. It's useless. I'm going to ask for a royalty for something like the Small Nations Games, right? Because they might be using this thing. Or if that bank had come to me and asked for you know, my photo on every credit card, I would have asked for 50 cents for every credit card, for example, because the credit card is not being sold, technically. Um, but I can ask for 50 cents on every credit card. Right? So you have to analyze. What situation do you have in front of you? What makes most sense? The lump sum with a deposit and then the rest later? Or a lump sum and a royalty? Sometimes it makes sense, the royalty, but it depends on your situation. So let's talk about copyright. I'm glad I'm kind of on the mark with time. I'm going to drink, OK? That's why I'm going away from the camera. Gosh, I need to ask for permission. <laughs> um, so what's copyright? What does copyright cover? We're going to be looking at mainly Maltese law, but most of the principles are shared with other countries, okay? Not only European Union countries, but countries everywhere else around the world. In Malta, copyright applies to literary works, artistic works, musical works, audiovisual works, and databases. Hey, didn't you already mention databases? Yes, databases have their own database right, and they're also protected by copyright. Layers, onions, the crew. All right, there you're getting me. Um, these are the categories created by Maltese law. Other countries have similar categories. They might have an extra one. The United Kingdom, for example, has dramatic works. And that means that in Malta, dramatic works aren't covered. No, layers, again. A dramatic work is usually a play, so you'd have a script, literary work. Yeah? And then maybe scenography, artistic work. Okay, layers, onions, think about it. It really, like, you really need to, to wire your brain in this way now because it's no longer, ah, it's a film. No, it's like a million things that layer up on top of each other. You have the film itself, audiovisual work, the original soundtrack, musical work, the script, literary work. You might have a storyboard, artistic work. Yeah, layers, onions, okay? Think about that. Some very basic info about copyright. I have to be a bit fast with you guys now because we don't have a lot of time. Um, we are rewarding the creator of the work, okay? And you are being given exclusive rights over your own work. For copyright to exist, the work has to be fixed and original. We will understand what original means in law. It has a different meaning to how we say, ah, that's really original. No, it means something different in law. And fixed means it has to be in kind of some kind of tangible or digital format, okay? A material kind of format, even though digital isn't very material. Anyway, how long does copyright last? It lasts the lifetime of the author and 70 years after you die. A long time, okay? It's a long time. Um, and what we get, thanks to an international network of agreements, if Maltese law gives me copyright in Malta, I am protected around the world. France, Brazil, Japan, China, Vietnam, everywhere. Germany, France, Italy, I already said France. Spain, Finland, Denmark, everywhere. Without needing to register it. It's amazing. That's why 
Madonna can sue Felix Buzottil in Malta for using her music without permission. What's going to happen? Um, because of this national treatment reciprocity principle. Because if the law of your country gives you copyright, every other country around the world recognizes that copyright and treats you as though you did it in Malta or in that country. So your photograph is protected in Germany, in France, in Italy, everywhere. Ma everywhere, why ma everywhere? Why? Because there are two international agreements and practically all the countries in the world have signed them, including China. So we're pretty much sorted on the copyright front. And as way back as like the 1870s, we had this rule that we didn't need to register copyright in order for it to exist. So what do I need to do for copyright to exist? The work has to be fixed and it has to be original. Only. So my presentation is covered by copyright. The recording that they're taking of my presentation is also covered by copyright, but I have to give permission for my presentation to be recorded. Because with the new work, the, the recording that has copyright over it, they are capturing my work, which also has copyright over it. So, we already covered what fixation means. It has to have this embodiment of images, sounds, whatever. And it has to be original. What does original mean? Do you guys know about the monkey selfie case? A man, so, um, a wildlife photographer set himself up in the jungle, or whatever it is that you call it. I'm not very good at, the, at those words. Um, and the monkey came along, just like this, you know, they found the, the setup and took a photo of itself. The monkey selfie. The photo went viral, and the photographer said, Hey, it's my photo. I have copyright in that photo. <laughs> um, it, all, it went all the way to the, to the courts in New York. And uh, everyone has the same kind of philosophy about originality, which means it has to have. For example, in America, it is the sweat of the brow. It means it's your work, okay? And in the, in the UK, they say it's the skill, labor, and judgment. It is your skill, labor, and judgment. On the continent, in Europe, they say it is the imprint of the author's personality. How romantic it is. It's the imprint of my personality. There's a stamp of my personality in the work. <coughs> These have been reworked by the European Union to say it is the author's own intellectual creation. It is the standard we use today. So what happened with this? What does what are those all those tests I've just mentioned? What exactly do they mean? They mean that the work has to come from a human author. Did the work come from a human author over here? The monkey pressed the button. And so the courts in the United States said, because there's no human author, there's no copyright in this photo. Bye. Dismissed. And that was at that time PETA came in the Association for the Protection of Ethical Treatment of Animals and said, we will own the copyright on behalf of the bonobo monkey and we will use all the proceeds generated of the use of the, of the photograph to you know, put money into research and uh, conservation of the habitat and the bonobo species. And again, the court said, there is no human author, so there is no copyright in the photo. Which brings us to AI. Our enemy or our friend. Um, this is the next Rembrandt. It's a project whereby they fed the AI all the works of Rembrandt and they asked it, create a new painting in the style of Rembrandt, please. And it did this. Not an existing Rembrandt work, based on the works that it was fed, and it created this. Protected by copyright? So far, no, because there is no human author. Right? Um, that's the discussion we're having at the moment with regard to AI. There's no human author, so we're not going to grant copyright. India went into, no, we will grant copyright to AI-created works about a year ago, and now it's changing direction again, so we might be all again on the same level of, no, AI-generated works won't have copyright over them. But, there's other copyright issues with AI-generated work where Reuters, for example, are suing, um, not ChatGBT, but another AI bot on artistic issues. 
because they found out that whenever the AI is creating works, it is taking parts of photographs to create a, a larger picture. Therefore, copyright infringement of all those different photographs. Why? Because the AI was fed the Reuters catalog of photos and it used them. To a certain extent, that some images generated by the AI in the parcels that it used even had the signatures of the artists which it mangled and stretched because the AI doesn't know, right? It just sees an image and it puts those pieces together to form a bigger image. So there's a huge issue with AI at the moment. Frank. Can I ask, with the, uh, I guess on the topic of appropriation, yeah. would, that, would that be considered, could that be argued as appropriation? No, no, it was totally argued that the AI is copying and appropriating the work of somebody else. Definitely, and it is guilty of copyright infringement of Reuters, for example, because the catalog was traced back to them. Yes, yes, if it's online, it's being used for AI training, well, yes. Reuters are doing this at the moment. And so, because Reuters have found evidence, because Reuters you can't spot, if you, if you can't see a generated AI generated image that has some clear indicating that there's a part of the photo from yours, basically what I'm saying is since it's, I assume it's a civil case, that someone has Yes, to it's sue. always a civil case, yes. So, no, well, currently, no authority or nobody is going to sue the creators of Midjourney, for example. They are. They are being sold by Reuters now, with Journey. Uh -huh. So yeah. Main, yeah, yeah exact. Nobody is going to sue on behalf of sort of the art the community at large. You have to have But there are so there are two court cases at the moment. There's the one by Reuters and there's the one by the Association of Photographers or Artists, I forget. There are two people who are so suing either Midjourney or another one, I forget what it's called. And they are suing them. Because they have the evidence, obviously. You don't sue when you don't have evidence, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Because unfortunately. Is, yeah, how do we get away with it? There's no evidence. Oh, I'm uh, joking. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> like, it's guaranteed that most people's work online has been taught. Yes, it has been used for training, let's put it say, this way. Training the AI. If it's online, it would be most of the, the big ones like the Jersey, have been scraped. They've scraped so much now. Mm. Yes and no, I'm not sure. They need the, to know. The way it works, the journey more than that, really. Yeah, the as journey us. Journey is very good. It's available online. Especially if you're sharing on sites like Flickr and whatever that are so aggregators. If you're saying, if you're saying, if you don't place it on an online platform, it's only transfer, that's something you protect. As that, as that. We're saying if it's an online platform, if you posted it, as that, it's, it's being scraped. It's being scraped. But the fact is that even though it has been taken, it might not be used yet. So then it's after it's being used that you can get the, the opportunity to sue. It has to be used. And then you have the evidence of the use, and then you sue. The technically, the scraping itself should get your permission. But you could say, OK, fine, for the scraping itself. And then once it's used, though, that is definitely an infringement of my rights. Well, they're getting, they are getting away with Yes, unfortunately. Let's talk about who we are. We are authors, okay? And even here, the law tells us an author is a natural person, meaning an individual, okay? Again, it cannot be a company, and it cannot be the AI who is considered as the author. If AI is gonna to start to be considered as author, we need to change the law. This is from our law. And for an audiovisual work, like what you're doing right now, the director is the author of the audiovisual work, okay? There you go. And what about the owner of the copyright? It's either the author or a person who has received the copyright from the author. Can we be joint authors? Yes, we can work together and be joint authors. However, in order to be classified as joint authors, our work, individual contributions, cannot be separated from each other. So if I took 10 photos and you took 10 photos, are we joint authors? No because our work can be separated from each other. I took 10 photos, you took 10 photos. 
it's a maybe a bit more difficult in the in a photography context perhaps to have joint authorship but think about Lennon McCartney they wrote songs together and it's true Lennon wrote songs on his own and McCartney wrote songs on his own but many times they wrote songs together in those cases they're joint authors okay um, Simon, uh, Simon Bartolo and Loran Villa wrote Al Inferno, a trilogy um, in Maltese. They are joint authors because they didn't write a chapter each, they actually wrote it together. Okay? If we're writing codes together, we have to be writing it together and not I did this section and you did this section and they are identifiable because we've put in our tags, for example, to have joint authorship. Okay? I'm not going to go into a collective work. Basically what a collective work is, is like the yellow pages where you have a lot of different contributors who you never know their identity, putting together the content, and then it's released by the yellow pages company limited, okay? That is a collective work where the people who are taking part in it are not identifiable. Usually, in your context, you are always identifiable as the photographer. Issa, what does the law in Malta classify as an artistic work. This does not mean that only these things are artistic works. Other things can be as well, but paintings are usual, okay? Paintings, drawings, etchings, maps, plans, diagrams, works of sculpture, and photographs. Photographs are artistic works, okay? <clears throat> for example, works of architecture in the form of buildings, Renzo Piano building, for example, that's protected by copyright. We have to be careful of the photos we take of the Renzo Piano building because it's protected by copyright. Yeah. Yes, uh, we're afraid of our own copyright, but then we rip off other people's work. No, we have to be careful. That's why we need to know what there could be. Ah, yes, that sculpture by Austin Camilleri, that has copyright on it. I can't take a photo of it and make it into a postcard. Hmm. All right, all right. And the works of architecture as well. So what would this be? This is a frisbee. And there was a court case in the United Kingdom where Whammo, the makers of this frisbee, sued their competitors for making frisbees that look like them under copyright of an artistic work. Insane, right? They managed because it was held that a frisbee is an engraving because, you know, these lines are engraved into the plastic. And what about the heating plates on the sandwich toaster? Again, another UK court case. And again, this was held to be an artistic work a sculpture, because they are molded, right, and therefore sculpted plates, heating plates. Not the whole thing we're talking about, but the plates, right? So that's why you have different sandwich toasters with different plates, because, yeah, they're sculptures. How long does copyright last? We already said so, but let's look in a bit more detail. So we have 70 years after the end of the year in which you die. Okay, and uh, when it's an audiovisual work, we mainly base ourselves on the principal director. If he is not known, then the author of the screenplay. If that person is not known, the author of the dialogue. If that person is not known, the composer of the music. Fine, but usually the director. If I release my name under a pseudonym, a name that nobody knows, that does not, it's on my name, a different name, so, 70 years from the end of the year in which it was lawfully published, usually, right? Or, if I become known, then we apply the first, the first rule. And what about if we are joint authors? Um, think about Lennon McCartney. One of them died. John Lennon died. So, the 70 years aren't running yet, because we start to count them from the last person to die, which would be Paul McCartney, and he's still alive. Um, I had a client who wanted to use, um, they were doing an advert, and they wanted to use a Beatles song in their advert. Guess how much it cost? Oh, you half a million came into uh, Zagerat. 50K. 50K. 40K, yeah. An advert, which is like, what, 10 seconds, 15 seconds? And that's factoring in the audience and the world marketing. Yep. No, actually what we did was I have a friend who knows the people and he told them, listen, it's just for Malta, no one's gonna see it. And it wasn't, things weren't online like would catch up at the time. And they gave it to us for 400 euro. But my friend so died, shit. The, <laughs> what do you mean? Like, for a, like I don't what do you mean, do whatever we want? Is 
is out of copyright. Is that right? Yes, so but that means, exactly. So after all those time passes, then you can do what the hell you want. So the works of Shakespeare, Winnie the Pooh, and now Mickey Mouse, because um, Walt Disney has died more than 70, has now died 70 years ago now, officially. Um, but not everything on Mickey Mouse. Remember, the Mickey Mouse that Walt Disney drew is different to the Mickey Mouse we have today. We keep on drawing new versions of him to have more copyright over him. The Hans uh, Christian Andersen stories are out of, and the Brothers Grimm stories are out of copyright, so you can use them in any way you want for your film, right? But then your film has copyright. It's your film that has copyright. So Disney changed the story a bit, and they have copyright over their story. Get it? But not on the original work. The original work would be out of copyright. There are what we call neighboring and moral rights. Neighboring rights belong to people adjacent to the creation of the work. So producers of films, producers of music, performers. And the definition of performer could even include models in your photos, Todo Attenti, um, and broadcasters. And the moral rights, these are the ones that apply to you. The moral rights are the right that you will always be recognized as the author, even if you sell the work and you sell the copyright in the work, you will always be recognized as the author. That can never be given away. And uh, an important one, the right to object to derogatory treatment of your work. You've sold a piece to, I don't know, Spazio Creative, and they've done something to it. That is derogatory treatment to your work. You can stop them, because that's your moral right, and no one takes it away from you, even though you sold the thing to them. And maybe you even sold the copyright to them. That never goes away. So let's talk about the important points that we have to learn today. How, what do I own in copyright? Right? Now we know that our work is covered by copyright, right? Yes. What do I own? All this blah, blah. What does it mean? It means that the owner of the copyright is the author of the work, unless the work is a database or a computer program created in the course of employment. So, if I've taken photos in the, in the course of my employment, who is the owner? Huh? You. No, it's the company, you. The author of the work is the owner of the copyright of the work, unless it's a database or a computer program. So if you've taken photos for your employer and part of your employment, who owns the photos and the copyright? You, the author. Unless you give it away in a contract. Not with blah, blah. There has to be a contract in writing. And many times, People <clears throat> put in their contracts. Everything created in the course of employment belongs to the employer. No, that's not correct. We need to have some wording like, I assign to my employer who accepts, because that's a contract in Maltese law. I have to offer, someone has to accept, and there we have the, the sale, right? So we have to do it even with our copyright when we're selling it. I transfer to my employer who accepts for the money that I am being paid, like enough my salary, or it's a, it's a service, not an employment situation, so you're paying me 5,000 euro, 500 euro. For the money I'm being paid, the intellectual property rights, including the copyright over my work, will now belong to you, okay? It's not automatic. Many people in Malta will take advantage of you, and they will tell you, I hired you, so the photo is mine. No. If especially there's nothing in writing, the photo is still yours. But you cannot share it. Huh? You cannot share it. What do you mean? It's yours. You can do what the hell you want with it. I'll put it on a billboard if I wanted to. Unless we put it in a contract that I say, listen, I'm taking the photos for you. I will remain the owner, but only you can use them, so I won't share them. And so I grant you the exclusive, remember at the beginning when we did of taste and flair, it was non-exclusive, the example, but then I will give you an exclusive right to use it, meaning it's exclusive to you and I won't share it with other people, right? But that goes into your contract or in your emails with your client. Never base yourself on emails. 
emails, exchanges of emails can constitute a contract under Maltese law because when you go to the shop and you buy something, you don't have a contract in writing. You buy it and you go. That's also a contract of sale. But when we're selling copyright, remember, I buy a lot of art, including photos. If I buy the photo, I didn't buy the copyright on the photo as well. I only bought the photo. And the copyright remains yours. So then you can do other things with the photo. Unless you agree with me that you won't do other things as well. OK, so we have to be very careful about how we own and what our client is expecting from us. Does the, look, many times the client will expect that because they hired you to do the work for them, they will own the copyright as well. And you will be totally OK with that. Who the hell wants photos of some crappy event, end of year event kind of thing? Fine, you want them, take them. Because remember, there are exclusive things that, as the owner of the copyright, are your responsibility. Not responsibility, they are exclusive to you. Okay? And these are all these different things to make copies, to distribute, to translate and adapt. You might adapt my photo by drawing on it and creating a new work of art out of it. That's an adaptation of my photo, so I have to give you permission to do so. Communicating it to the public, putting it on a billboard, Ijefiri. Making available, putting it on social media, Ijefiri. Communicating to the public is physical, making available is digital. That's the, the, the difference between them. And broadcasting is broadcasting on media. TV, radio, that sort of thing. Okay? So all of these things I control because I am the owner of the work. So if taste and flair want to use my photo, what does this in involve? It involves making copies, because they have copies which they sell or distribute with the, with, the, with the newspaper, right? One. They might be putting it online, making it available. Remember those online scrolling kind of um, uh, programs? Huh? Make it. And they might also put it on social media, right? So again, making it available online. So we need to identify what they're going to be doing with our work because if I remain the owner of the work and I only give them a license to use, I can limit my license to one and two only. If I just tell them you have a license to use, it's going to be broad. It can, they can do anything. But if I tell them you have a license to make copies, distribute, because that's when they put it in the, in the, with the newspaper, right? Uh, and you get it from the shop and make it available online. I am removing these other things. And I am narrowing down what they can do with my work. I like to give the example. Call me old fashioned. Think about Little Red Riding Hood. She has the little offa, the little basket with the jars of um, jam for grandma, right? This is my basket and each one is a jar of jam. I can either sell the whole thing to you, or I take one and I let you use it. You take a bit of jam and you use it and you give it back to me. That's what I'm doing with these things. Okay? When, let me go back to that example of taste and flair. Oh, here it is. So let's read this again, because now we understand it a little bit better. I am giving you a license, meaning I keep the copyright. You are get, giving, being given permission to use only. So I remain the owner. I'm giving you a license already from the first word. We have so much information. Non-exclusive use. So it means I can give it to other people, not exclusive. I can give it to other people as well. Don't come and complain to me because I gave it to Frank to use on his own um, art project, for example, okay? I am giving you non-exclusive rules. Maybe I can tell you, listen, for 2020, you have exclusive use. And after 2020, I do my own other uses with the photo. That's another way of negotiating something with a client of a photo, and then you would specify what or whatever, to be used in the summer edition of 2020. So not any summer edition, very particularly on that edition only of the magazine, you can use my photos, for print, okay, and online distribution. Now we have that list of things, we know what to do. 
print and online distribution. It can be used in Facebook and on Instagram adverts, but only for the promotion of that edition of the magazine. So not for the promotion of taste and flair in general. You're not going to continue using my photo. Thank you very much. Ten years down the line, you're still using my photo. And not, you know what I mean? We have to be specific. Now, if you're not comfortable giving a, a contract to a client, at least say these things in an email and get them to agree. If they don't agree, there's no contract. Huh? You must have agreement from the other side. And that's why you can put it in a letter and get them to sign it at the bottom. Or you give them like a terms, like this is my fee quote, and at the back there are my terms and conditions, which would include those things, for example. I have a client, that's how they work, instead of having a separate contract. He got my contract. He extended the margins. He put everything on like font five, and it fits on the back of the, of, of the quote, of the, of the quote. And he tells the client, sign, read and sign, please. And they do so. And he puts in all the details that he needs. You can only use it. Usually on the quote, you'll have, you know, you can only use it on this thing and whatever. And at the back, you can't make other copies. You can't use it. I still am the owner. All, all the terms I would have put in for him go <laughs> over there. <coughs> so those are the things that only we can do as owners of the copyright. Now, I might have clients who I love, and I don't care what they do with the photos, so I transfer the copyright to them. The offer is no longer mine. It goes to them, and they can do with it what they want. And with some clients, I do that. Mm. I ask for the copyright outright. Why? Because, yes, you took the photo, but I need to edit it, put it up online. I'm going to have an online shop, so I'm going to have it on my online shop. And then I might have a catalog for Christmas hampers, and I want to put the photo in the catalog. And then I want to put that online on social media to you know, sponsor, advert my catalog. You know, I might need to do a lot of stuff with your photo. And you might be very happy to just transfer everything to me, so we do a transfer. So I don't need to come and ask you, listen, I didn't ask you for permission to put it in the catalog. Can I have permission to put it in the catalog? Oh, forget it. You know? It's not worth it. Just take all the copyright, and it's better. I'm better off that way as the, as the author and you as the person who needs to use it. So you have to use your discretion. This looks like a situation where they need to have the copyright, especially if they're an agency. If you get hired by an agency, 99% of the time we need either full transfer of the copyright or such a large and permissive license. Because why? The agency never keeps it for themselves. They have a client on the other end, so they have to pass it on to the client. And then if we're going to do billboards, an advert in the newspapers, and an advert on TV, we have to make copies, reproduce, distribute, uh, make available, and all of those different things. So we need a lot of different uses. So just give me the copyright, it's easier. Not worth the hassle, as our friend in the front said. OK? A bit better on understanding how everything works now. Complicated for nothing, yes, I know. Examples from abroad. Postcard from London, photograph was taken, and colored. So the photograph was taken in black and white, but the, the, the bus remained in color. <coughs> the same photo was, well, a postcard exactly with the exact same photo from the exact same angle and the coloration of the double-decker bus appeared on the market. One sued the other. The court said, listen, it's true. If a person goes to London and wants to take a photo of Westminster, the Houses of Parliament, and Big Ben, the best place to do it is from across the bridge. Fine. But combinazioni in the photos. The double-decker bus was in the same spot on the bridge, and the group of people walking were in the same spot and of the same you know, largeness, like number. It was too much of a coincidence. And in fact, it's all of these issues pointed to the photo being copied. All right? um, so th they would have allowed someone else to take a different photo from this angle, and you'd have different scenes on the bridge. But the, the scene was the same on the bridge. So that showed them it was a copy, copyright infringement. Associated Press versus Ferry. Ferry created the iconic poster for Obama's um, campaign, first campaign. 
Um, it was based on this photo taken by the Associated Press. They sued for copyright infringement and they won. Because it is an adaptation and a copy. Or oh, remember all those different things that we, you own, the jars, adaptation and copy. So yeah, that is an adaptation, for example, of your photograph being transformed into a different artwork, for example. Or your photograph being transformed into a sculpture. Jeff Koons copied Art Rogers' photo. Again, sued for copyright infringement, and they won. Art Rogers' estate won um, against Jeff Koons. However, in the United States, we have a new phenomenon called transformative use. Where in the United States, they say, if you take an artwork, a, pay, a photograph, a photograph by Richard Prince, no, Patrick Caru, sorry. Patrick Caru took this photo, Richard Prince used it, added elements to it, as you can see over here, and created a new artwork, selling for millions, that even the catalog of the exhibition was being sold for like exaggerated amounts of money. And it was exhibited at the Gagosian Gallery in New York. This would be copyright infringement in, Amer in, uh, in Europe and in Malta. But in America, because they are a bit more flexible, the judge called it transformative use, that you're using one work as um, like basic materials, raw materials, to create something new. And so they were, they got away scot-free with this, but in, in Europe, no, it would be copyright infringement, okay? Why? Because in Europe coming, we have a list of exceptions to copyright infringement, whereas in America, they just call it fair use. In, in Malta and in Europe, we don't have fair use. We have a list of exceptions and you need to fit into them. And if you don't fit into them, it's copyright infringement. So something like that, the transformative use won't fit into it. For example, caricature and parody is a fair use. Oh, is a copyright exception in Malta. Downloading is an infringement of copyright because you are making a copy and you are allowing others to copy from you. And if you ever have your works of art sold at auction or through a gallery in Malta, not on the first sale, on the second or the subsequent sale, you should be getting a royalty on what is being paid at auction or at the gallery. It's called the artist resale right. A lot of people don't know about it, and it is your right. So, for example, you sell your artwork to me, and I don't know, I've fallen off on tough times, and I've got an auction house to sell them for me, kind of thing. Or I sold them to a gallery, and then the gallery is selling them. On that second sale, not the first sale, on the second sale, we get this royalty being calculated on the sale of the work. Okay? That's it. Oh, data protection. We've already covered a bit of this. <clears throat> we have the GDPR as of 2018. It has a wider reach and bigger penalties. As you see, Facebook just got like, uh, uh, like guilty or they have to, so many billions, like they have to, horrible. Anyway, so what's personal data? It could be any information, okay, relating to an identifiable person. We were talking about that before. The person has to be alive. If the person is dead, there's no longer data protection over that person. Um, so what can it be? Name, city footage, email address, phone number, health data, bank details, and more. Date of birth, your calendar, education, your work history, warnings that you receive from the HR at work, those are all personal data. Special categories of data where you have to be even more careful about using them include genetic data, health data. I had um, a student at MCAST, he wanted to use x-rays in his artwork. But okay, that's health data, but you couldn't be identified by an x-ray of your arm or of your rib cage, so that was okay. Religious beliefs, okay, racial and ethnic origin, trade union membership, genetic data, and biometric data, now it's all about fingerprints and faces and all that. <coughs> When can I use data? If it's anonymized, I can use it. So I cannot find out who the person is, okay? But if it's pseudonymized, so like when you have a, an exam and you are number one, two, three, and you're number one, two, four, and you're one, two, five, and I have the key to decode those numbers, that's pseudonymous data and it's not um, 
it's, uh, it's, it is personal data, so we have to be careful how we use it. When can I use information? If I get the consent of the data subject, or if I get a contract. Now, this is an important distinction. A model release form is a contract, not consent. I don't know. A model release form signifies consent, but it isn't just consent. It's actually, there's a contract. Why? Because when I give consent, I can take it back. I have the right to erasure, and I have the right to withdraw consent. But if I have a contract, I cannot withdraw consent. So the model release becomes important, that you structure it like a contract where the person gives you okay, their go-ahead to capture their image and likeness and to use it on a specific project. Okay? Thank you. Questions? Questions? Don't laugh. Ask questions.